morning. Good morning, Vice Chair. Good morning. Morning, County Council. Morning, Commissioners. Morning, Administrator Huffer. All right, looks like everybody is here. At this time, we'll call to order the Amhill County Board of Commissioners formal informal session for August 5th, 2021. And um, Ken, would you mind leading us in the pledge? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. And uh, let's take a look at our joint calendar session. Do we have anything to add, commissioners? Chair, um, we had kind of discussed in our in our meetings about uh, potentially not having a session on August 26th. There were various reasons for that, but um, it sounds like County Council, as well as Todd, is going to be they're going to be out of conference. So I think that's a discussion we probably should have if that's something that commissioners are amenable to. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Ken and I and Christian had discussed at that taking that week off. I'm pretty sure we have, uh, let's see, we have a discussion scheduled for the 19th. Not sure about the 26th, but I am not going to be in on the 2nd. So uh, whether we take the week of the 30th off uh, either way, I, I will not be at the session on the second. So if that impacts the decision on what week to take off. Ken, a Christian, Ken. Yes, I was pulling up the, the hearing schedule um, and we don't have anything currently on the, the September 2nd is identified as being one of the dates for a land use hearing. Um, I had planned to have a conversation with Ken Friday to see if there was anything that we needed to be aware of. Forgot that Ken Friday's out this week. So I wasn't able to follow up and, and really get some insight if, if we do have uh, uh, a land use hearing that may be hitting our direction uh, for either of those dates. So I could... Ken's going to be back in the office on Monday. And so I could do some follow-up and see, depending on which dates, the 26th or the 2nd, whichever date that the board's looking at not having a, uh, uh, a formal session, um, I can confirm and we can adjust, you know, as we can, you know, around any land use hearings that may be scheduled. Well, Chair, um, I'm around uh, for both of those um, times, um, but it's it. Um, if Commissioner Bershauer um, is comfortable with uh, the two of us doing sept the September second, and I'm I'm happy with us foregoing a meeting the previous week, the the 26th. I'm looking at. Yeah, and I think Christian said that the the newer attorney will be on, but I think that's his first week. So we're not really sure. <laughs> Trial yeah, by fire is good. the nicest thing to do, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, either Todd or I could be available on the 26th as well. We would just be remote. Um, oh, okay. Um, oh. And, um, but either way, the board has had meetings uh, without Council, council president. I mean, it's not something that's required. I know, shock of shocks. Um, it's not required, but we we are generally here. And if the board would prefer, uh, we can certainly be available for that. Um, but yeah, that is the the new attorney's first week, uh, if all goes as planned. Um, and while he did volunteer, he he has he did have a year of experience as county council, assistant county council in Coos County. Um, we were a little hesitant to just kind of, you know, toss him into the deep end in his first week. Although he said he would. 
Uh, so either week works. I just I, I wanted to make I just want to let the board know that we would both be um, out of the office on that Thursday. But if the board chooses to meet that Thursday and then take the following week off, that that works as well, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, then I take back my proposal. Um, let's make sure that Commissioner Star Chair Sarah is here. Um, and uh, since we will have County Council available remotely, um, I'm comfortable with the 26th and then not meeting on the 2nd, if we can switch around those land use hearings. Commissioner Burschow, will that work? Yes, that's absolutely fine with me. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for those accommodations. Anything else, Ken, that we need to consider as far as our joint schedule goes? I'm sorry, Commissioner. I I hit the wrong button and and I muted the meeting where I couldn't hear anything. So um, we well, just made we just made a lot of really important decisions, and I think we're about ready to wrap up now. So um, right. no worries. Okay. No, anything else we need to consider as far as the joint schedule? But it looks like we're just going to try to work out the specifics of those dates. But it looks like we will uh, try to work for the 26th, Commissioner Kula. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to um, check in on next week. Um, I still have um, a tour of the um, the Newburgh Dundee Bypass Trail on here, but you had mentioned communicating about a different day, so I just wanted to check in about that. Yeah, no, we we noted that, and uh, I've told them that I have a conflict that day, so I need to try to reschedule. And they said that was not a problem, so I think we're good. Everybody else have anything else? And the only other thing I had was that. Um, I, I just you I think we all probably saw that the McMinnville City Council is hosting a work session on the um, CARES Alliance um, and I'll be you know calling into that one. Thank you. Anyone and then else? The only other thing is August 23rd. I had my dates wrong. It's August 23rd from 10 to noon is water task force meeting and Oregon Water Resources will be doing a presentation on groundwater monitoring quality um, rights um, responsibilities of homeowners and farmers. Okay, and, and you might want to just bring that up the week we, we have. I will, for sure. Do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, Ken, anything else? No, if there's no uh, edits or anything we need to be aware of, and if, if, if something does come up where it looks like, uh, you know, um, a couple of commissioners are planning to attend, you can email Carrie and I, and we can make sure we get it on the joint calendar. All right, thank you. We'll move on to public comment. We've received public comment. Thank you everyone who took the time to send us an email. And thank you, Carolina, for getting those to us even up to this morning. We have a work session and that is the review and discussion of the American Rescue Plan Act. I know Ken has been working long, hard hours on this one. So Ken, we appreciate that. And we'll begin our discussion with a little bit more detail of what we've been discussing the last month or so. Right. Yep. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, so we've been having a number of discussions. Uh, this, I mean, it really goes back to May during the budget process um, when the American Rescue Plan Act, um, when some of the details were being released on that, the direct allocation of funding. And, and the board has had a couple of work sessions where we did some looking at the funds available and doing some initial kind of 35,000 foot view on, on priorities and, and determining um, how you wanna allocate funds. And at the same time, we've been getting a large volume of requests that have been coming in that, um, and, and you know, and one in particular, the Sheridan School District request is a pretty substantial request that we've had some discussions. And I thought it would be good because I, I think there's a lot of questions and I'm also trying to determine um, staffing, um, solicitations, processes, agreements, all the things that go into place anytime that, uh, um, we're going to write a check or, or fund a proposal or something before you, making sure that we have sufficient information that you can make an informed decision um, on to proceed or not. So I did put together a quick, you know, um, kind of PowerPoint that I've been working on that, is, and it's something I've been working on up until the start of the meeting this morning. And uh, it's it's not pretty. It's a working document, so disclaimer um, on that that uh, but 
let me see if I can share the screen here. Can everyone see? Okay. Yes. All right. So again, for today's work session, this is where I get messed up because everything's on different screens. Um, find my notes here. Okay, so for today, and, and my apologies if it's difficult to read and, and just let me know if I need to zoom in um, um, to make the, the text a little bit larger and easier to read. So just a little bit of background. Again, as you know, we received a direct allocation from US Treasury. Uh, we've got 50% of that allocation. Uh, we received it in May. And then we're anticipating the second installment to come uh, in May of 2022. And then I'll just highlight, you know, cause there's another, you know, a lot of times we've been using the, we've been referring to this as ARPA funds, um, but this is also called the state and local fiscal recovery funds. I'm trying not to use too many different acronyms or kind of float that in, but just in case there's any confusion, because I know other jurisdictions are using the SL FRF allocation uh, to reference. And that's similar because each city, um, districts, counties, they're, you know, depending on the allocation, um, got direct funding from the same funding source as we did. Uh, the Treasury had, had released guidance earlier in the spring. They've been updating with their FAQs around the eligibility requirements, what the funds can be used for, what they can't be used for. We did adopt uh, and, and appropriated the full uh, almost 21 million in the 21-22 budget, but then also just keeping in mind that uh, we've only received half of that again, um, so we can we can we could spend half of that amount today if if we needed to. Um, but because we haven't received the additional allocation, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. But we did appropriate for the full amount to make sure that those funds were available. Uh, the funds are currently in an interest bearing LGIP account. I, I think you've uh, with the meeting with the local investment advisory committee and the treasurer is advised showing uh, where those funds are, are currently sitting that we've received. Some key dates uh, to keep in mind, a lot of this is internal. August 31st is the, the first interim report that I need to submit to US Treasury. October 31st is my first quarterly expenditure report that I have to submit to Treasury. We have to obligate the funds by December 31st, 2024. And then all the funds have to be spent and work completed by December 31st, 2026. So when you, you know, it's something important to keep in mind that we're, we're considering requests that, um, especially for larger projects that are maybe capital projects, I'm thinking like the water or sewer infrastructure type projects that, you know, they need to be pretty close to shovel ready and knowing that a lot of these infrastructure projects can take years of planning to complete. So it's just something really important to keep in mind that these funds have to be spent um, by 2026, uh, the end of that calendar year. The other thing that I, I want to highlight as a large note is just a reminder that these are one-time funds. You know, upon the funds being spent, there's no further ARPA revenues anticipated. And so that's something to keep in mind when we're looking at proposals uh, in the various categories when we're talking operational support or when we're talking about standing up a new program, that this is one-time funding and not necessarily going to sustain a program ongoing. And, and so I just, I think it's really important to highlight that these are one-time funds. Any questions on the background? I'm trying to keep it really generic because we've talked about this multiple times, but I just thought in the interest of any of the public that may be watching this meeting that, that hasn't seen the previous discussions to make sure that we have some of this information out there. So as I mentioned earlier, we've we've done multiple work sessions in May and June and had discussions. Uh, 
you know, and, and the board uh, determined some prioritization uh, of some of the different program elements and funding percentages um, on how it'd be applied. Uh, commissioners have been going out and, you know, so we had an idea what the need would be out there. There was some informally, you know, hey, you know, demonstrate some needs, submit some proposals, let's, let's get an idea on the areas. And the, a lot of that, those responses to those um, requests is, is what drove some of the decision making around, you know, where to identify and place funding. And then during those discussions, you know, you know, there consensus, um, you know, that utilization of this funding should be directed to the projects that have a long-term return on investment. You know, that was very clear uh, during the discussions that I know that's a priority for the board. And then, as I mentioned, you know, there's been other work sessions that were more specific to actual funding requests that came through like the Sheridan School District. So again, you know, on the, the slides I'm gonna start going into, the intent is I'm, I'm looking for direction on, on how we're going to start rolling out more formal processes for soliciting, considering, approving, and processing you know, funding requests. Um, I think it's gonna be really important that because of the reporting requirements that I have, that I have to, you know, for the US Treasury, uh, that ensuring that all of the projects that we're funding meets the funding criteria, that the funds are being spent as proposed, um, for auditing purposes and reporting purposes, I think it's going to be really important to make sure that we have defined processes in place um, for how these funds are, are rolled out. And then it also enables me uh, to determine staffing uh, for implementation of the various programs and the types of RFIs, RFPs, and et cetera, or grant solicitations that, that we put out there. So again, um, just kind of repeating, you know, we have reporting requirements and we need to ensure compliance with treasury guidance. So I, I won't repeat that again. Um, we're still pending further guidance and information. It seems like treasury based on questions that are coming up um, that, you know, they're constantly updating their FAQs, uh, you know, something uh, like uh, whether or not the funds can be used as a match towards a federal grant, a federally funded grant. Uh, right now, there we're still pending um, some more guidance from Treasury on that. But right now, it's anticipated that no, you know, which is kind of typical for any, you know, for a lot of federal funded grants that you can't use other federal funds to match that. And, and so, it's just something to kind of keep in mind that if we're getting a proposal that, you know, that an organization may be looking for matching funds to go after a capital grant, that, that we may have to, you know, be clear that, you know, they're going to have to do their due diligence to confirm that these funds can be used as match for some other program. Uh, and again, there's other specific prohibitions about the use of these funds. I continue to review this and, and, I will continue to work with staff and with county council to make sure that any of the solicitations that we're doing under the programs, um, that if we'll make sure that those specific prohibitions are clearly identified in, um, in any announcements that are put out and make sure that that's also spelled out in any agreements prior to the release of the funds. Again, I'm, I'm trying to limit the exposure to the county that if we end up releasing funds to an organization, they use it for something that's not eligible, that we're, we're mitigating or minimizing the risk and exposure to the county that we have those in place that, um, that we're just ensuring that the funds are being spent appropriately. And again, I put in my other reminder, these are one-time funds. And you know, I think it's just really important to, to highlight that and that Again, I think most importantly is the fund, all the funds and the work has to be completed by December 31st, 2026. So, so I'm sorry that some of this stuff is gonna repeat itself through some of the slides, but you know, I think it's some really important notes to kind of keep in mind as we start getting into more detail.
So again, based on the, and, and you may still have copies of the spreadsheets and, and the documents that we had uh, from the work session, uh, I believe that was in June, that we went through the exercise that our total uh, allocation is $20,800,000, just over that amount. 15% um, of that was identified for public health response. This one I kind of call AKA more internal uh, than external. I, I really see the public health response is, is looking at you know, some of our internal needs in order to respond to the public health emergency. Uh, 33% was identified for economic impacts, 14% for revenue loss, 33% for water and sewer infrastructure, and 5% for broadband infrastructure. So first starting, and so now I'm gonna jump into more of the details and, and what I'm hoping is you'll see when we start getting into some of these, the, the slides in here, it, it's not really intended to be a presentation. It's, it's more of a working document and I'm gonna be taking notes as we go through this um, and, and to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to solicit your input and, you know, on priorities and, and direction with this. So again, you know, with the public health response uh, for the 3.1 million, and, you know, I'm recommending that these funds be focused on internal county operations to continue response to COVID-19 and also improve our ability to respond and operate during ongoing or future declared emergencies, uh, uh, public health emergencies. Uh, I've been working with departments and programs, identifying priorities and projects, to date, and I, and I just wanted to put some of the items that I've seen as, as the administrator as some of the, the priorities and some of the needs that I've at least identified from the, what I've heard from departments so far. Uh, the first one is public health and HHS facility needs. Our, our public health building, as you know from the space needs analysis that uh, we did in 2019 and into 2020, uh, identified that we have some shortcomings with that facility, and this is something that that the the condition of the facility, the, the location. There are some improvements that need to be made uh, to that building to to build capacity or have better capacity for responding uh, to these types of public health emergencies. Some of the other projects we have identified is our ERP replacement project which is our central finance system. Uh, this is a portion of that. Uh, there's a lot of, with the proposed, uh, with our move to the Graviton product that we're currently working on, we have a lot of paper that flows here in the county and that when you're in a situation to where you have a, a large portion of your workforce that is working remotely during an emergency or a lockdown, you know, it doesn't facilitate you know, social distancing very well when we when we're so paper driven at this point. And so I think it's going to be really important. And also it's our central nervous system for the county and and being able to have a more robust, up to date central finance system is going to be critical for now and going into the future. I also have facilities and capital improvements identified. We've we've had in 2020 we were able to use a lot of CARES Act funds, the direct allocation of our CARES Act funds for everything from um, uh, making facility improvements, you know, things to enhance social distancing, hands-free items, uh, masks, everything that we've had to do as an employer to kind of deal with. We still had that ongoing cost that's moving forward. And so I wanted to be sure that we identified some of those funds to at least help us into the next year or possibly two years to continue to uh, deal with those unanticipated costs. Uh, new County website project. This is something that I've been working with IT on. And, and I think this is another item that's really critical uh, for our, our website is due for a replacement and update. There's a lot of shortcomings with the website. And one of the biggest things is, is 
simplifying on how we get information and updates out to the public and get records and, and information posted to the website for the public. There's a lot of, uh, it, we're, we just we really need to update the website and have a more usable interface for our departments to use and especially for um, departments that need to get out information in a timely fashion uh, related to an emergency. And then we were finding that fiber and network improvement is that that's another project that we've identified. And again, with a lot of uh, telework, a lot of with a new robust system, trying to become less reliant on, on paper and more electronic files that we need to be working on security, uh, increasing capacity for you know, not just external broadband, but also for internal looking at our fiber and network capacity. So these are some of the areas that, uh, that based on the list that I brought forward. So then you have a, an idea of, you know, what the, the 3.1 million um, is really what I would see as some of the priority areas on how we would direct that. Uh, any questions on this one? And I have a question, and I don't know whether you will get to this or this is included. And one of them has to do with the, the fair revenue loss for transit. Did we not receive any kind of, of refund or, or funds that were going to cover that somewhere else? I'm going to I'm going to show that when we get okay. to the revenue loss section um, that are more specific to that question. OK, and I have another question, sure. and, and that has to do with our website. Our mm -hmm. website really does need some help. But I'm wondering if, how much of that is just the we just don't have the personnel to be able to do a lot of those updates. It seems to have been an ongoing problem over the years is we just can't get the stuff done on the website because we don't have anybody to do it. I think it's it's twofold. It's um, because the the website we had was built in house, so uh, a lot of the right now to get information posted to the website, you're going through IT. I really envision on a getting a new website rolled out that we will decentralize and have departments have more direct interface or an ability to make those updates to get information posted to their department pages instead of having to navigate going through IT and then possibly running into a workload bottleneck at this point. Um, we have programmers in IT that, that do this work and get this posted and they're, and they're doing that in addition to all the number of other software projects that they're working on. So one of the things that I'm really hoping is to get make the investment into a new website. And then that website would have the capability that we could train departments to then expedite. So we don't necessarily have to go through a bottleneck and put in service tickets through IT and kind of bog them down to get information posted that we can have a direct connection and, and get that information posted more timely. Thank you. All right, so next, if, if there were no other questions on the public health, then I was going to, you know, get into the larger one, uh, which is the, um, the economic impact, one of the larger ones. And, and this one, you may recall that, so you identified the 6.8 million for economic impact, and this is the category that probably has, you know, the, the widest um, eligibility definition for the various projects. And during previous discussions, uh, you identified 33% of that being avail made available for childcare projects, 33%, a third of that being available for impacted uh, industry grants, and then another third for nonprofit uh, related grants. The workforce development, we didn't identify any specific funds for that, but we know that we've gotten a couple of requests, including the, Sher the Sheridan School District's request. And there was also a Chemeketa Community College that also had a workforce development proposal of around $800,000 a request there. Now, whether those are treated separately as a under a workforce development category, or if there's a nonprofit grant, there's some, Depending on the, the proposal that's submitted, there's 
you know, it could be a nonprofit with a child care project or, or something along those lines. There could be some connections elsewhere um, that will require some, some further vetting and, and discussion. We've already, you know, through the just kind of informally reaching out and with the organizations that have submitted proposals, we've got almost $9 million in requests that have come forward in this category and only 6.8 million identified. So this is another one of the examples of where I really think that we're gonna to have to do some work under each of these categories and doing some formal solicitations and setting some guardrails and how much funding is gonna be made available. And, and so then it gives everyone some more clarity about what they're applying for and how much funding they may get approved. And, and then I think that'll simplify the decision-making process as the proposals are vetted and, and awards are approved. So now I'm gonna get into more detail. Again, this was a larger one um, for economic impact. So the childcare, you know, we received a single request, uh, but like I said before, I think there's a couple of the proposals and the, what I'm calling the nonprofit grants that may also fit into this category. We haven't done any formal solicitations. You know, the proposals that we've received thus far lack the sufficient details, uh, you know, to kind of determine eligibility and compliance with the guidance. And so, um, Christian, you have a question. Yeah, Ken, I'm just wondering, we're still on the cover page, at least I am, on the screen. Have you been actually moving through through slides or are those starting oh. away? I just wanted to point it out. Is everyone not, has it not been moving through the slides? It is not, Ken, but um, I'm just like keeping it going in my head. Okay. Yeah, you well, mentioned you were going to get to some later. I wasn't sure you were ready for the event, so I hesitated to mention it. I thought I should bring it up. Thank you very much for interrupting. I did not know that it was not scrolling through the screens. But you have some of these on the original spreadsheet that you sent us from, from the last time. So we do have some of that information. All right. So yeah, the can county it, specific work was a little bit new. It was the newer components. Okay. Can everyone see, what is everyone seeing? The economic impact? Do you see me scrolling? Yes. You see the next page? Okay. Yes. That's weird. All right. My apologies for the technical issues and thank you, Christian, for pointing that out because otherwise I'm putting a lot of information out there and I was thinking you were seeing what I was presenting. So my apologies for the technical issues on my part. All right, so uh, childcare, economic impact. So here's some of the, the bullets and information that I was briefly going over. We've received a single request. Um, again, I think there's a couple items in the nonprofits that would also um, potentially fall into this category. So the, the first kind of question I would like to, to put out there is, uh, you know, to determine eligibility and provide funds where needed, uh, does the board want to proceed with some kind of a formal process, whether it's a grant or an RFP that we put out there? And and then the next question that I would have is, what would you what would you like to see in the process? Um, Commissioner Cooley, are you, are you ready? Because otherwise I have a quick comment. No, go for it, Chair. Okay. I mean, I mean, but I'm happy to just wait. Thank you. So we have, as you said, we do have that request, but I'm wondering if we, if we did a process where it was more of an RFP and we had grants and if, if the grants, uh, the request submitted reflected, in other words, how quickly can you expand capacity either in existing childcare operations or in home care, which, which would be easier than actually a whole new facility. But, but how quickly and what does it look like in terms of the ability to, to uh, increase capacity? So to me, that immediacy is important. And also the fact that you can be a little more flexible when you're adding uh, increased capacity in a home-based situation. But I also know that we have other situations like the relief nursery 
and uh, what's going on in the West Valley and in Newburgh. And those are up and running types of programs. If they need additional funding to increase capacity, those might be, that'd, that'd be something to look at because it's, it's already going. Because one in, in thinking, um, are you kind of envisioning that, you know, cause one thought that came to mind that I'll just kind of throw out there as an idea, if we were to break this up into a couple different categories of uh, capacity building or versus new operations, you know, and, and, you know, that, uh, that would be another means because knowing that if you're if you're doing a startup or something new, the the financial need for starting a, something new is going to be quite substantial. Um, and if we're doing like a capacity building or an operational expansion, we could do smaller grant amounts and make those available. Kind of a two tiered approach. If, if that makes sense, it's a long, it's similar to like we do with the economic development grants uh, out of uh, with the video lottery funds that we have, you know, more, we have startups, we have capacity building, you know, we have a couple different categories that come into play on that. Well, I'm thinking more in terms of what just personally, uh, capacity building, because those other startups are really expensive and it would take a while for them to get up and going. It's great, but what we need are the, are the slots right now for kids. So I'd say capacity building would be something that with an, with, with a, an operation that's already functioning. And Terry, I think I would um, echo that, but just um, that I know that some operations, they can't expand because they, they, they need to invest, right? Okay. So I, I, another part of it, perhaps another question to, to ask and to have as consideration is, um, can you, um, will this money allow you to expand this year? As opposed to just like, um, uh, do you need more money to expand, right? Because it feels like I, I want to see it like you, I want to see it happen this year. And I would like to see an RFP process that's, that's relatively quick turnaround if we can. I agree. And I believe the last process was fairly streamlined. So it wasn't streamlined for you because you had to do the work at the end, but just as far as making it, making it pretty user-friendly as far as the, the application itself. And then chair, if I may, I would also like to add that, um, uh, I received an email a couple of weeks ago from Heather Richards um, at McMinnville Planning, noting that um, one of the new, I don't remember, I'll, I'll have to look it up, but one of the new um, requirements for in-home care is that they install sprinklers um, and that that is, a, in her view, was a big barrier to the in-home, which you had mentioned. And so even if, even if part of this is, um, uh, sending out through Early Learning Hub and Head Start and all the other organizations to let in-home providers know that um, they can apply for funding for this work. Yeah, just bring, putting that out there that I think we need to make sure that the, there aren't new barriers. Well, that is a barrier. I mean, that's not going yeah. to make it easier for people to do childcare. It's going to make it more prohibitive. And uh, I don't know how many people can afford to add sprinkler systems to their home. So yeah, here we go. And that's why I'm grateful that we have this process at least moving forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, um, so Commissioner Bershower, did you have anything you wanted to add? Thank you, Terry and Ken. I just, I agree that this is gonna be a little bit complicated just because I think the grants, the straight up grants to existing childcare providers would be much easier to uh, work through versus creating new capacity or new businesses that can handle uh, child care. That's, that is a, that's an uphill battle, um, especially when you're talking about all of these um, layered requirements that you have to go through in order to get there. I think that's a much lengthier process. So I guess my priority would be on expanding capacity of what we have already um, which could also be complicated given what's happening now with, uh, with COVID and some of the changes that are coming. Um, you know, and some of these childcare ideas are 
they're coupled with other um, programs like with the Sheridan, um, the Sheridan SeaTech uh, program or, or idea that has a childcare component in it, but it's, you know, that doesn't happen unless the whole thing happens. So I just, I see this as being a little bit tricky um, as to how we roll this out, but I would prioritize um, existing business, childcare businesses or in-home uh, care that had to scale back because of COVID. Now they want to uh, ramp that back up. Um, and whether that's an RFP or granted, um, you know, whatever is, is better there, but $2.2 million, that's a lot of money. I think we're going to, I think we're going to struggle to spend that quickly um, in terms of, um, you know, even with existing childcare facilities. So that's, those are just kind of my thoughts on that. Well, I think that I think the relief nurseries might be able to come along and relieve us of some of that big chunks of money quite quite quickly and easily. So I think we could we could plow through that <laughs> in no time. <laughs> and I was chair, I was going to say that. I was also going to add that um, um, in, at least in my initial conversations with Zach Geary, counselor from the city of McMinnville, um, uh, he and other folks at the city are interested in expanding kids on the block as well. So there's another existing program that can expand if they have the funding for it. And then we've got the Youth Outreach Center, which functions as a sort of a quasi child care option for after school and, and, and sometimes during the day. So there's that, and that's a huge chunk, but that's a whole nother discussion. But anyway, yeah. Are there, because um, I have this written down as a question, are there specific elements or criteria that the board would like to see? Because what I, you know, as far as next steps, I didn't, you know, that's further down is what I'm going to be doing is based on the feedback that I'm getting from the board. You know, I'll be working with staff, we'll take a step back and we'll work in each of these program areas and put together more an outline for each of these, what these RFPs are going to look like. And, and I think it's helpful for us to know if there's concerns, specific elements, criteria, um, you know, private versus public, you know, it, it's just a, throwing it out there as an example um, on the types of programs that you would like to see incorporated in that or something that we should pay attention to when we're uh, working on the draft. And then the second question that I have, which is in the next bullet, is just again a reminder that that 2.2 million is based on our total allocation, but we've only received half to date. So you do have options that if you wanted to make half of it available now and then look at another round in next fiscal year for another round of grants. But I also know that it also depends on the number of applications and need and what it looks like that. Uh, that will be, have some flexibility to adjust and, and operate with, within our appropriation authority. Commissioners? Um, Chair, thank you. I would, um, uh, thinking about Commissioner Bershower's uh, observations with, um, with CTEC and kind of how it does have a childcare component, I'm wondering about whether um, a way to do that is to, uh, for allocation purposes plus criteria, is to think about having two categories. One that's, um, you can expand childcare opportunities this year, um, and then and then two like perhaps have two thirds of the funding allocated for that, dedicated to that, and another third that's, um, this is long term, um, you know, transformational scale. Um, uh, opportunities and then have a third funded for that or a third allocated because I'm thinking that if Commissioner Bershauer um, has indicated you know CTEC is going to move slowly but it's also going to um, it has the potential to really change um, the community um, and also provide child care opportunities into the future so it just seems like having having some criteria for the like let's get this done soon and then let's get this done um, in order to make, make lasting change. And obviously childcare now will provide lasting change as well, but I'm just thinking in terms of time scales. Agreed. So that would be a criteria and an allocation timeline. Right, so you're talking specifically then if we were to look at half of the allocation for this fiscal year. Well, Chair, I said two thirds and I'm, I'm mostly thinking that because of- uh, The whole you know, thing? 
um, uh, Relief Nursery, and um, uh, you mentioned some other ones, and Kids on the Block. I'm assuming that there's plenty of opportunities to get childcare as quickly as we can. I'm sorry, I just, no, I was just wondering, are you, are you suggesting that this is the two thirds, one third of the entire allocation or just the, the half of, of what we've received? In other words, what we've received. Yes, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking of the entire allocation. Okay, but we only have half of it, right? So we'll get the other half of it. So we really have what, a million two to work with? To start with, but yeah. it also depends, you know, how we, how we appropriate that if, you know, and again, I'm, a, we're supposed to receive the second half of the funding in, um, in, in May of 22. So, um, it, the funds are coming. That's why we appropriated the full amount, but, uh, you know, I'm just always careful and just know that you have options that if you wanted to do just, a the 50% of that and make that available in a round of grants for this fiscal year, we could do that. And then you could do a second round next year, or we could do a solicitation based on the full 2.2 million and keeping in mind that maybe some of the proposals may have a multi-year component to it. So we provide funding year one and then funding year two, or there's different options available on how we can roll this out. And, and so I just, I think the biggest thing is as staff, we can get into the details of what the RFP and prepare something to bring before you so that you're going to have the, the final review and approval of what the program looks like. I think my biggest questions is whether or not there's any red flags or anything that, you know, I, I don't want to bring something for you that, that the board would not be in support of as well. So I, th I think that's also an important element to have at this point. Uh, Commissioner Burschauer. Thank you, Chair. I think it's probably a good idea to do the 50% now and then 50% later, um, just because I think as we make our way through the school year, there's going to be a lot of changes that are happening. Uh, and maybe we just revisit that next uh, May and say, okay, you know, did the money, where we put the money, did it work? Uh, did it um, serve the community where the needs met? Because what I'm thinking of is prioritizing, you know, the programs that we've talked about, expansion, after school programs, those are some things that as a, um, as a child, my working parents uh, relied on. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. So, oh, and employers, um, if employers have ideas for providing health, uh, child care for their employees that maybe is a little bit outside of the box, that kind of stuff where we could meet them um, this year in anticipation of the school year. And it's gonna be a very different school year uh, as, we're, as we're seeing. So that's what I would, that's the kind of priorities I would say right now. And I think 50%, it's still $1.1 million. You know, it's a lot of money. Um, and maybe we come back next uh, May and say, okay, did that work? Um, was there a greater need on some of those um, programs? Can we put, funnel more money there and meet, meet some of those needs? To me, it sort of makes sense and kind of provides a little bit of a check and balance on, on where the money's going. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm wondering if uh, we look at, again, the nonprofits that are already you know, standing up and already have, have programs. I know that there are a variety of different, I know, uh, Newburgh Christian, uh, North Christian, Northwest Christian Church in Newburgh has an enormous program as far as childcare and, and school. And they really took in a lot of kids who had nowhere else to go this last year and sort of really quickly uh, got something together. So if programs like that, that are up and running, that have kids that are involved in it, we, I would think would, would be wise for us to just fund them so they can increase capacity. And then also, I'd like us to look at our nonprofits. Let's look at TTRS or let's look at uh, Provoking Hope or, or anybody that has a component where parents might need to have access to after hours care for either for court appearances or drug and alcohol treatment, any of those things that we can get those really hard to place kids 
in terms of slots for daycare, night care, whatever, we get those covered. Because right now, I don't think that's being addressed. We need a, more of a court care and um, addiction treatment uh, cover for, for kids whose parents need help. So Chair, I wonder whether um, we can add that as um, as one of, if, if this makes sense to Ken, is to add that as one of the criteria, like a question, are you, um, tell us if you are able to provide um, care for uh, children who are in this, um, you know, this category, this time slots, um, and whose parents are needing to do X, Y, and Z. Would that make sense as a criteria or a question? Because then we can score that as, as part of our funding. Yeah, I'd love to see that as one of the components. Obviously, we don't have to necessarily give details about why a child might need to have have that care other than their parents are needing to be somewhere at night or, or something. But I, I think that would go a long way to covering the, the, the those kids. Okay. Then I think I have, uh, I, there's probably gonna be a lot more uh, questions and discussion, but I think I have enough that we could start building some framework on, on what this is gonna look like. And then again, I kind of look at it with all these categories that this is just a kickoff overview discussion. So each of these with the, with based on these discussions, we're gonna put together proposals and then come back and, and probably have it uh, slated for individual work sessions on that specific, you know, um, RFP or grant program that's going to get rolled out. So um, I think I have sufficient information at this point that um, we'll know what to, how to proceed with this. Thank you. And then Chair, I was going to, I was thinking in my head, like, well, um, do we want to also have, we've done in the past added a geographic component, but I will say that with childcare, it's so scarce all over the county that I don't really think that that's an appropriate measurement tool right now. No, and then we, yeah, I, I agree with you because I see that there are certain initiatives going on in various parts of the county, but that they're either not up and running or uh, pretty much everybody has that that dearth of, of childcare options. So Ken, are, are you saying that at this point, maybe the best thing for us to do is to consider this, work on this, come back and allocate this money and then work our way through the various categories, economic impact, revenue loss, water and sewer infrastructure, and just do it that way instead of throwing everything at you at once to have to come up with those RFPs? I'm not there yet. I, I think that's going to be some discussions once I get through all the slides here um, is when we start talking about timelines and what you would like to see first or kind of timelines. So great question, because um, I had the, the same question because I'm looking at staffing and I'm looking at how we're going to roll out this. And, and, and I probably didn't cover that very well at the start, but I think that's one of the largest, you know, what I'm hoping is an outcome from this going through this is to kind of highlight the number of RFPs or grants that we're going to be rolling out over the next several months. So then we can work on those details. I can identify the staffing and make sure I have sufficient resources to get all this, um, to get all these programs out in a timely fashion as well. Thank you. So the next one, uh, can everybody see, did the screen change? All right. I'm, I'm probably going to ask that for because I can't see it on my end if, if it's not displaying correctly. So, so then the next category that we talked about is impacted industry grants. And, and again, you identified that you wanted to make a third available for grants for impacted industry. Uh, per treasury guidance, you know, what, what the treasury had its impacted industries was tourism, travel, hospitality, and other impacted industries that experienced a negative economic impact as a result of the COVID-19. Uh, the other impacted industries, so it's in quotes, because I, I think that's gonna be a, a big question uh, for the board, is how we want to define other impacted industries, because realizing that when it comes to uh, an economic impact as a result of everything that's been taking place for the last year and a half and, and going into the future. There's a lot of industries 
that have been impacted by this. Um, you know, so there, that's an open question about, and I'm not sure if it's easier to identify the industries that the board really wants to prioritize, uh, or if it's easier to, to go the other direction and highlight, you know, the areas that wouldn't be eligible for a grant program like this. I, I think it's up to the board, I, you know, um, on, on how you want to narrow that category. Uh, we haven't done any solicitations again. Again, we haven't done any solicitations on, on any of the programs. Um, and we haven't done anything informal related to this. So we haven't received any specific requests, no informal requests during the previous discussions uh, specific to this, because I think it's uh, much like uh, a number of the grants that we did with CARES Act funds last year that we, we set a dollar amount, we did a solicitation, and then whether that's a lottery draw or you have a review committee or, or how those funds are going to get awarded, uh, there's still a lot of questions on what, you know, you would like to see under this category. Um, you know, one thought you could do is you, we could mirror what we did last year. Um, with some of the grants that as far as eligibility and how they get processed, where you just make, a, as an example, a $10,000 grant available and we try to uh, get the funds out to as many impacted businesses or industry areas that, um, or you can make a larger dollar amount and really narrow the eligibility uh, uh, criteria or priorities um, and do the awards that way. So there's, um, so again, this is more just discussion, kind of looking for um, your thoughts on how you would like to see this prioritized or, or what you would like to see in a, in, in a grant program. Thank you, Ken. Commissioners? Well, I'd say, Tara, that, um, oh. Commissioner Kula, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Tara. Um, I, um, I've expressed a hesitation with doing um, uh, direct grants. Um, and I think it comes out of um, like cash grants. I think it comes out of a similar concern or skepticism or caution that you've expressed about, are we really reaching um, everybody, right? Um, and that's often very challenging. And so I think my initial response um, has, my initial response time and again has been, um, what kind of work can we um, can we fund? What kind of projects that will help everybody in impacted industries um, to uh, like essentially to create opportunities or to reduce barriers across the industry so that everybody has an opportunity um, rather than just an opportunity for, for cash, but rather an opportunity to expand their business, hire more workers, you know, make the community thriving, um, and. To that end, uh, I would say that since I'm not an expert in any of these industries, um, I'm only an expert in what I know, um, that I would propose that we um, bring in Abisha um, for some of this, um, the, the, the first stage before we go out um, and do a formal solicitation from folks is to hear what she and the economic EDAC, I think it's EDAC, what, the, what EDAC, um, from, because they're spread out across many industries, some of which are impacted and some of which, some of which are impacted negatively and some of which are impacted positively by this um, last year and a half. Um, so that's the starting point I would see. Um, and then I, I think that the 50% uh, 50 are over or allocated all at once would to me really depend upon what um, Abisha and EDAC brings forward. So that's what I would propose. The only hesitation, Chair, is that um, I have been hearing from business owners on Lafayette, or in Lafayette on 99 who've been really hard hit by the, um, the, the massive delays with the ODOT work there. So that's one area where I think maybe we should set aside some money and actually go and talk to business owner, the owners there about how we can help them. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Commissioner Bershauer, thoughts? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would echo what Commissioner Kula said. I think that in our initial discussions about this particular bucket of money, we expressed um, 
that you know maybe the the best use of the funds wasn't just to hand out cash grants and that's why Abishal went back and did an analysis of how you guys um, ruled out the the previous one and found that it actually was you know fairly well um, spread out through the through the county and impacted businesses that were that were in need so um, I don't think we have a pressing need to go back and say you know who did we miss um, and part of that discussion was also the businesses need help, but they need help in different ways. Um, one of the main ways is the workforce issues right now. Um, they're facing inflationary costs. There's sort of all these different things that they don't really know individually how to solve. Um, and so the, dis the discussion was, how can we help them solve some of those problems, maybe outside of just giving them you know, funds or whatever to do it themselves. So, some of these issues are larger than a single business can can solve. Um, Abishaw has come up with some workforce um, programs and ideas that would be worth funding, um, but I agree, and I think I, I remember us having a discussion about creating a committee that uh, was was EDEC, but it was also um, you know, folks from the chambers and, and folks that are in, involved directly in these industries throughout our county coming together and saying, okay, how can we kind of collectively help some of these issues? So um, I don't really know 50% now and 50% later, I don't have a good read on, on that. Um, you know, maybe that's just our default for now, but um, I do think that in terms of the criteria, you know, our overarching criteria was to make sure that it had generational impact. So I think if you're focused on the workforce issues, then you're getting there, you're, you're, you're hitting on that, that criteria. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, specific grant programs, I really think those are the, the highest quality programs are gonna come through uh, the SEDCOR or the, or the EDAC. So that's, that's what we should be focused on in terms of the first step. Thank you. And I would also like to add that, uh, while well, I, I think we've got a great broad representation with EDAC and SEDCOR certainly is the, is the go-to uh, concern in this area. I'd love to see Orla involved. I'd love to see some of the advocacy or lobbyist groups involved because what they tried to achieve during a legislative session they might have some suggestions about how we could mitigate some of the damage done during the lockdown. So I would love to get Orla on board. I know our restaurants are really struggling and have been struggling. And now they've got the issue of workforce inability to hire people and, and that whole thing. So yeah, I'd love to see those people have a seat at the table, at least even if it's just to weigh in with a statement. Ken, I'm oh, sorry, you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to, based on the discussion that we were having and and with our agreement with SEDCOR, you know, because I think some of the things that we have that, that might be helpful is like for this specific area, this 2.2 million that we have identified for impacted industries, this would help kind of create some guardrails so that then I could follow up with Abishaw and say, okay, here's two, you know, here's this bucket and and here's the, the feedback that we have that, that the board has provided, um, you know, uh, come up with a proposal or, you know, we could start, it, it, it sets a little more guardrails than necessarily looking at all of the funds that we have here. So that would be one of the outcomes out of this is I could have a follow-up conversation and with, with Avishan to say, okay, we've got this 2.1 million or 2.2 million, um, and here's all the, the feedback that I have from the board. So um, she can work with um, the, the EDAC, she can uh, reach out to some of the other committees that, and, and groups that you've identified and, and then to put together a proposal to ensure that these funds, this 2.2 million is being directed as the board would like to see it directed. Thank you. Oh, chair and Ken, that sounds great to me. Um, and I think as part of that, perhaps we could even direct, if commissioner is comfortable, direct um, the guidance to um, what would you do with 50% now and 50% after May, um, right, May of 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, that that way we get a sense of what what are the timing for the 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 
universe of possibilities. Like, oh, we can fund this then, and you know, here's two phases, or maybe it's a, a, a one chunk this time. And then I want to go back, Chair, if I may, to Commissioner Bershauer had alluded to um, things like um, you said something about workforce training um, or like skills development. Did, did you, Commissioner Bershauer? Okay, and I, I, I seem to recall that there was at least one proposal from Chemeketa. Was that what you were referring to? Okay, great. Yeah. Because I think that's that a really good point. Good. That, that'll help people and it'll help businesses, right? Yeah, absolutely. Ken? All right. Um, I didn't have any other, were there any other questions or anything that uh, commissioners wanted to add for this before I move on to the next one? No, thank you. All right. I'm scrolling and I'm guessing everybody saw that uh, it moved to the next one. I can see. you. All right. So then the next one we had what we called in a category of nonprofit grants. Um, and it, it's not just nonprofit organizations, it's, it's public agencies, nonprofits, it's, it's kind of all rolled into that category. Uh, we again identified a third of the funds for that, totaling 4.7. Um, but we haven't done a formal solicitation. We, we did receive informally uh, uh, $4.7 million in, in, in requests. And uh, so this is another one that we could work on developing a description and plan for a formal process, doing a grant program. And, you know, again, with questions about award amounts, criteria, eligibility, prioritization, and, and all the same questions we've been having on the other funds. Um, so this is one, if there's anything in particular, because realizing that some of the proposals that we may receive may fit multiple categories, but this would be more um, kind of a, you know, maybe it's not necessarily childcare, it's not uh, uh, impacted industries, but they're rolling out some programs and, you know, or, or having capacity issues. Uh, remnant initiatives is one that comes to mind that's on the list that doesn't necessarily fit to one of the earlier categories, but uh, they've been impacted and um, they've had impacts with the pandemic that has to do with their, you know, again, it's their operational funding. This would be a Band-Aid type uh, solution, you know, a short-term solution, but, uh, you know, it, just as a quick example, I'm not saying one way or another it should be approved or not, but I was just thinking of an example that doesn't fit into one of the other categories. And could we also add a, a, to the list of criteria would be, are you receiving any ARPA or a, are you receiving any funds from another entity? Because I know that for instance, the CCO is proposing uh, using some of their uh, share profits to fund housing, housing projects, which include Stratus, the Sheridan Project and Project Turnkey. So if you have significant amounts of money that are going to be, um, dedicated to those projects if we know then we can consider those when we're considering whether to fund them from our funds and do that we can add that and pose that question and i think you know and especially if you're looking like a regional type project that maybe the city of mcminnville is making a contrib contribution to it and newberg's making a contribution to it and the counties you know and and that's part of the funding you know, I'm hoping that we don't end up with overlap <laughs> where we're all funding maybe the same project. So I think we are going to have to include some criteria that gets into the what additional funding sources are they receiving in support of this? Because, again, like I said earlier, I also have to pay attention to whether or not these funds are eligible to be used as a matching contribution towards other funding sources that they may be using for that same project. They might have asked for funding, but if they haven't received a determination, I think they should put that in there as well, because a lot of people have asked us, but we haven't been able to give them an answer. So, yep. Commissioner Kula? Yeah, thank you, Chair. That's a good point. Um, and, and I would agree. I think that um, um, the, the suggestions and guidance that Chair has provided um, so far, I think, is a really good point. I do... Um, 
I did have one one thought about this. I mean, there's a lot, obviously, and um, there are a lot of opportunities for a lot of organizations to come to us with this category. Um, the the one thing that um, with the skies uh, out here, smoky today, um, the one thing that I am uh, trying to figure out is uh, I don't I don't want to go over the head of our emergency manager, but I also want to consider us. Um, uh, an eligibility criteria is emergency management, um, you know, stockpile, granting, connecting, um, communications, the work that I know that he's working on, but um, it, it's, it's often grant based. Uh, and so this would be something, uh, this would be a category or eligibility criteria is um, emergency preparedness um, work. Um, and I think it would, they folks would have to be working with um, uh, emergency manager young, but it seems like at this point it would, to me, at least it'd be a high priority and criteria is, um, will this, you know, the question of like, will this work um, enhance our emergency preparedness in the community? And are you working with emergency management? Well, I'm not sure how that fits in. It's just that it feels like we have an opportunity if there's eligibility criteria in the, um, the treasury guidance to include this as a, as a type. Thank you, Commissioner. I can look into that. Commissioner Bershauer. Thank you, Chair. I guess um, this might be along the same lines of that, but I was thinking that not all of these grant requests are for operational costs. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would want to have uh, set award amounts just because, um, you know, one nonprofit might be coming forward and saying, hey, if we had funds to buy a used bus, we could service, you know, this many more people versus, hey, you know, we've lost 50% of our operational income. Can you help us out for a year? So I'm not, that was kind of where I was going with that. I think, I don't know if we, I don't know if I feel like we need to place a criteria for emergency management. I mean, if, if CERT wants to come forward and ask for things, you know, I feel like that's, it's just sort of an open thing, but, um, I was thinking about the award amounts and, and, you know, we might place higher priority on operational expenses, but I also think that we should steer away from having specific amounts just because, you know, a used bus to a particular nonprofit is a huge deal. Uh, whereas, you know, keeping the lights on could be a make or break for another one. So. Yeah. And the, 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 the funding that, uh, you know, the reason I ask about award amount sometimes, because I think one of the challenges is if you do an open-ended solicitation and we have 2.2 million and somebody, somebody submits a $2 million request, then you're having to weigh that against some of the other priority requests. But then keeping in mind that during the approval process, you can say, hey, we understand that you've asked for two million. We're willing to give you a half a million uh, to assist with this. That doesn't necessarily, um, you know, give you the full amount, but at least it's a starting point. So, you know, that's why, you, you know, if there's specifics around award amounts and and things you wanted to identify there, it just helps provide clarity in the request. So. Um, cause as you can see, when we do informal requests, you know, we identified 2.2 million and we got 4.7 million in, in proposals. And so trying to, um, again, when that decision's being made that, that somebody submits a $2 million request, um, and if it's approved, then all the other categories that were, you know, the other organizations that may have applied, you know, it, and so it just helps kind of create some further guardrails and, and it's something that we can work on and, and work on that language. So in, in the document, and again, we'll be bringing this back, you know, any before any announcements are made or, or what the formal process is under this category, we'll be coming back to the board to, to flush that out a lot more. Thank you. Appreciate that, Commissioner Kula. Yes, um, I think it's. Uh, I think that Ken made a good point about the the open ended nature. Um, perhaps we can, um, if commissioners are in support of this, perhaps we can say that something along the lines of requests under five hundred thousand will be uh, considered a higher uh, a higher um, scoring uh, project. Just 
sometimes it's helpful to have some some range. Yeah, we've certainly got the range. Uh, uh, people have not been shy about asking for uh, the moon, and I don't I don't blame them because they had no reference point. I mean, what are we talking about here? Everyone hears that all these government entities are awash with money, and and a lot of money has been handed out, but just how much is up for grabs in in each category? So, uh, I think that's uh, that's important to note. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. You've done a lot of work on this. Appreciate it. Okay, so I'm scrolling on to the next one. So again, this is the workforce development. Uh, we didn't identify any percentages, but again, we have you know the three million dollar request from Sheridan School District, and then eight hundred and six thousand, um, eight hundred and six thousand that uh, was proposed by Chemeketa. So there's a couple things that you know, whether this falls into the, the category that we just covered or, or possibly these types of requests could fall into the two previous ones. And so um, I'm thinking based on the, the conversations that I have with, with Avisha about the impacted industries, because seeing again, with the priority around um, wanting to see long-term positive effects in, in, in helping industries that both of these categories could, you know, could fall into that. Both of these proposals could fall into that uh, priority or, or that requirement. So, um, so again, I, I, if it's okay with the board, your thoughts about the, the workforce development that we could include that as a criteria in the other two programs for for possible funding. That sounds good to me, Ken. Yes, All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. I'm sc scrolling. Everybody can see the move. All right. Okay, and for this one, we agreed to put 14% uh, percent of the total uh, allocation into revenue impact. So um, I'm continuing to work with departments. The U.S. Treasury put out a really, they said it was a simplified formula until you see the formula. And, and we're all kind of scratching our heads as, as we're trying to use it because one of the challenges um, for revenue impacts, it's not just being able to use the funds for impacts that have occurred during the time frame looking backwards, but it's also for anticipated revenue impacts moving forward as well. So this is something that I'm still working uh, with departments on that have experienced revenue losses due to the various restrictions and um, you know, and this is internal um, for county operations. And then, you know, I provided some examples. Um, one, I, you know, for the fairgrounds, this was some, I just looked at, you know, the fair revenue and the, the impacts that they had during the last fiscal year uh, by not being able to host events that that was a $260,000 estimate that they took just by not having a fair and not having a number of the horse shows and really trying to, to modify their operations. Uh, transit's another easy one to kind of look at because we have not been charging fares with transit. Um, you know, so during 2021, uh, it was anticipated that we were going to have about three, just over $300,000 in, in fare revenue is what we had projected for the year. And, and so that was a direct impact of, uh, of, of the cuts in service and the not charging fares. And, and, and then uh, HHS was able to, at a very high level, uh, Christina and Lindsay uh, were able to provide an estimate on what they were looking at on, you know, with a lot of the you know, because there's a lot of revenue that they generate and services that are being provided, and they were looking at a $1.4 million revenue impact during last year. So those are some examples, and I just wanted to highlight, uh, you know, just doing a, a brief look back, but we're continuing to work on this category um, and also trying to, to use the, the formula that the Treasury um, 
provided to, on, on how we do those calculations and determine those revenue impacts. There, there could be a lot smaller numbers in other departments, but I was really trying to stay focused on the departments or programs that are really revenue dependent. You know, they're, they're not getting a large amount of, uh, of property taxes or, or direct allocations, but they do have a, they do generate a lot of revenue that supports their programs and operations. And so I'm providing this as an overview. This is, you know, if, if you have questions or thoughts on, on this, there's still a lot of work to be done on this category. Um, and, and I'm still having discussions with departments. Ken, as far as transit goes, did we get any other resources that were supposed to backfill uh, anything that was related to COVID for transit earmarked? Transit did get funding assistance through CARES Act. Um, they had direct funding that was separate from the general county CARES Act allocations that were coming in. So if that was coming in, what was it supposed to do? Was it just supposed to mitigate some of the, the various changes that had to be made? It, didn't, it, it wasn't able to be used for right. revenue loss? Well, um, CARES Act could not be used for revenue loss. That was one of the big changes between uh, the Rescue Plan Act and CARES Act. CARES Act, it was absolutely, you could not use it for revenue impacts. Um, and one of the changes with this, with the, with the ARPA was they changed the criteria based on a lot of feedback that, you know, revenue impacts weren't addressed with, with previous uh, um, funding that had come out and been made available. So we couldn't use it for revenue, uh, CARES Act. So we couldn't use it for revenue, but that money was used for other Correct. other costs. Now, what about planning? What about what planning and what about the clerk's office and their revenue, which is pretty much dependent on their operations? Uh, the clerk, I, I did look at some of their revenue impacts and I and I have that information. I, I didn't include it as a bullet in here because it doesn't equal the the revenue impacts that you're seeing in these other, you know, I really pulled the really high categories, but um, planning on the other hand, um, building industry and, you know, while, you know, um, Ken, there were impacts due to COVID, you know, with just like the rest of county operations that we were having to, to spend funds that we didn't plan on spending funds for social distancing and, and additional computer resources and things like that. Uh, really, Ken did not see, if you remember during the budget presentation, a, a, a large impact. Uh, home building was still occurring, building activity was still occurring, getting, you know, so that did not slow. That wasn't uh, necessarily an industry that was impacted quite like the tourism, hospitality, or restaurants and those things. In fact, I, I would say with the um, just looking at what the building market and housing market's doing right now, um, it hasn't really slowed. Okay. And Chair, this um, this looks uh, like a good start to me. Yeah. yeah. I do want to um uh, with with a Gary at Fairgrounds regularly talks to us about um, the the need for infrastructure improvements there um, and. I think there's a facilities master plan. I'm just thinking um, it, that it, I'm wondering, Ken, whether this is an opportunity to say, okay, we we lost the revenue, but we're we're going to make sure that we're that the costs are covered, and then from here, are there is there money left to do things like install an HVAC in um, you know one of the buildings, uh, which again, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, we're uh, in, as a community, we're shy of air con, larger air conditioned spaces for heat waves. So like, how can we improve the, the fair infrastructure while still, um, while, while increasing emergency re response? Sorry, I'm, it's, it's been hot, so. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bershauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, maybe I missed it, but is that in another bucket? 
for internal uh, infrastructure type of needs or COVID related response needs? It, it could be. Um, I didn't get anything from Gary um, or, you know, uh, but the, I, I, that's a great idea. Um, you know, uh, of something that I could work with Gary and get something included in the um, public health response category. Okay. That was what I was thinking. We had kind of set that aside as internal county needs for, um, you know, better HVAC systems, et cetera, et cetera, more infrastructure related needs per COVID. Um, I do want to say, though, that the fair had a record breaking opening day, which is fantastic. Um, in fact, I think it's higher than, uh, you know, past several years for the first day, which is, you know, a Wednesday. So that's pretty incredible. So good news there. <laughs> and, and I, and I will say, and I'm sorry, did I, if I interrupted anyone, um, that I really see because it, the, the public health response and the revenue impacts are because those are, uh, internal, um, county needs that these are addressing that I could kind of, I can work with the departments and based on the outcome, maybe that there's less of a demand to, to replace the lost revenue and more of a demand to, as an example, take the 1.4 million for HHS. If instead of applying it to a revenue loss, you move that up and it just further contributes to a, a, a capital plan for doing something with the public health building. Uh, same thing would go with instead of just simply replacing the revenue loss from the fairgrounds that could fund a specific project. Um, so I could see where the revenue impacts and the public health, because they're both internal, uh, I think we have some flexibility to, to kind of move those funds between the two. And, and the one thing we have to remember is that that fairgrounds functioned as really relief for so many other uh, uh, people in other counties and uh, without the facilities to support that. I mean, we saw what our limitations were uh, last year, so. Yeah, Chair, I think it would be really. No, I was just going to say, hopefully we don't have to do that again this year, but uh, it was, it really, it was a godsend for so many people, but we were, the constraints, we may do, but the constraints were obvious. Yeah, I second that, Chair. Um, I, I think that if we can, um, uh, if uh, Gary and staff, um, and if if Ken needs to, to help them with identifying projects that um, you know, are going to help the fair and event experience, but also um, double as improving um, the situation, you know, for um, for its use as a mass, mass gathering spot. Um, I, I, I would really encourage that perhaps even um, over um, doing revenue loss um, reimbursement. So what I can do, because it, because the other part of the conversation is, you know, with the revenue losses is also enter, talking to Gary and seeing, you know, because of course he had to cut a number of expenses, you know, you don't have the revenue, you're going to have to, you know, so what does that number look like to, um, you know, to kind of vet that out even more, not just replacing revenue for the sake of replacing revenue, but also to, uh, put those funds to make sure that any cuts that were made at the fairgrounds or or any of these other areas that that um, service level is restored, and then any additional funds would go towards you know uh, other projects to address some of the other priorities that they may have there. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I'm scrolling again. All right, so the next, uh, another big one here. So that was, you know, everything that we covered under the economic impact category based on the discussions. So, um, so then the next one, um, and and we covered the income loss, and now the next one is water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, this is another large one. This is one that we we got a lot of responses from a lot of agencies that gave some. You know, uh, the proposals really weren't specific. There, there were some big numbers that were provided that, uh, you know, that really highlighted to me, well, we need to put some uh, guardrails and, and see what a solicitation is going to look like to um, to go out to um, 
cities and districts um, and organizations that manage uh, water and sewer infrastructure. So again, we have 6.8 million. Um, there's a long list of infrastructure needs that I think every single city responded um, and highlighted uh, some of their projects. I, I do want to highlight that again, kind of circling back to one of the earlier slides that you couldn't see because I didn't know it wasn't rotating through. But again, just to, to reemphasize that um, just knowing how long a water and sewer infrastructure project can take from, from concept through planning and engineering and everything they have to go through to actually breaking ground and completing the project. This is going to be one that I think we're going to have to you know, I'm going to recommend that we're looking for a little closer to shovel ready or at least being shovel ready within the next year or two um, that you can identify funds and you could have that recognizing that uh, a water and sewer project, depending on what's being proposed, can be a very expensive and probably require multiple funding sources to make that happen. And then also, I think asking the similar question as uh, was proposed in some of the earlier ones is what other funding have you got allocated for this project or identified for this project? I, I also think it's going to be really important. Um, so, you know, there's several different ways that we can approach this. We can do, again, a competitive grant program. We can do an RFP we, or we could just come up with a direct allocation to cities based on a formula. You know, I think you have a few options available that, hey, based on this formula, you know, um, City of Amity, you know, um, we're going to write you a check for this amount and to use it for water infrastructure projects. And then we'll have an agreement and you're going to agree to use it for this specific category and you're going to report back what you used it for. Um, you know, so there's a couple different options or, or there's unlimited options available, of course, but, you know, depending on uh, what the board would like to see on, on what kind of a process you would like us to put together and roll out. Commissioners, Commissioner Kula. Well, Commissioner Bershower raised her hand, but I'm happy to add to it, but I'd love to hear her thoughts first. Okay. Commissioner Bershower. Thank you. I guess I would say that, um, I feel like these, these projects aren't where you can just scale up or scale down. I mean, they have a cost and it's sort of a set cost. So um, I would prioritize something that comes to us um, that is, you know, quote unquote shovel ready, but has the funding identified um, with a specific ask and a specific timeline uh, and, and really prioritize those and maybe that doesn't get us to the point where we feel like we're spreading the money throughout the county, but at least it gets done. I mean, the needs are there. It doesn't matter where in the county, the needs are there. I would, I would rather, uh, you know, if the ask is a million dollars and, you know, it, if we send 500,000, the project doesn't get done because it needs a million dollars to get done. You know, I'd rather do the project. So that's kind of how I'm thinking on on that. I wouldn't necessarily be in favor of a, a direct allocation to cities based on a formula. For me, this is more project driven. Um, and again, in the end, it might not be where we get to send McMinnville money or Newburgh money, but we've sent it everywhere else and those projects got done. So that to me, it's, it's about the end result. Uh, thank you. Commissioner, I agree with that. I think it would be nice for us to be able to fund everything, but we can't, and there's no point in spreading it so thin that nobody actually has gets to see a finished product. Commissioner Kula, thoughts? Um, yeah, I agree that I'd, I'd like it to, see, to go towards funding particular projects. Um, I do know that there are some that are phased approaches. So if we can fund one phase um, of something, um, it, it seems like, um, as part of this, it would be helpful. So I guess a competitive grant program is probably, in my view, I think how I'm feeling about it. Um, and I wonder whether um, as part of that lower, um, lower cost request, lower amount requests, get a, a higher 
um, a higher score, as it were, um, because I'm just thinking of, you know, the city of Sheridan has, um, I want to say it's a, it's either 75 or $250,000 request um, specifically for um, a master plan. And I know that that's not a project, but it's something that, you know, we have the money we could fund to keep them moving forward if it's eligible. And that would be the, the Ken nod. Um, I also want to note that um, avoiding a direct allocation to cities on a formula would also be my preference, uh, particularly because I had the Palmer Creek Irrigation District reach out to me and they are very interested in getting their, um, upgrading their uh, irrigation dam. And it seems on the surface like it's a very, it's a project that fits into our overall um, interest in what we're funding. So, but then again, there's, um, there's the Carlton sewer project that is a, it's a safety issue. Um, DEQ is ready for them to have it fixed right away, but it's also a much higher cost project. So, you know, to echo Commissioner Bershauer, um, if, if we don't have 6 million out to allocate for specifically for that one project, is there some part of it that we can fund um, that actually will go towards moving the project forward? Because I don't, I don't want to, um, yeah. I, I don't want to fund things that uh, just because, oh, we're not finishing the whole project. Thank you. Ken. Yeah, the one thing, and, it, and I realize my choice of words when I say shovel ready, that that makes it seem like this will only fund on the ground projects. But, we, you know, and then and, and, and unless there are objections or if the board would like to see a criteria that this is really funding on the ground projects, there were a number of requests that were related to master planning or or getting engineering possible maybe no it could be as simple as they just need funding for engineering um and then they're going to pursue later funding to do the project so um it by use of the term shovel ready and some of the requirements it, it's not necessarily meant to mean strictly on the ground projects unless the board would like to see that the emphasis really be on on the ground type projects and, and less planning so that was just a, a poor choice of words on my part. You know, shovel ready made it. So they need to be ready to go with the project within that. Yes, time. sounds good. Thank you. Okay, we have broadband left. Yay, broadband. So this one, this one's a little bit, we're a little bit ahead in the process here because we were already working on an RFI, uh, request for information. Um, and so we had just over a million identified of our allocation for rural broadband projects. We're working on uh, finalizing an RFI. Hopefully we'll get that released um, end of this week, early next week. Um, I'm, I, we're, we're basically putting the final touches on that. And so then we'll have more information depending on the responses to the RFI, that'll help drive any recommendations to come back to the board. We're, we're gonna have a clearer picture of what the need is out there. And then we also know that we have, this is another one of those, although a, a lot of these other categories are gonna also have various uh, additional funds that may be made available either through the state or 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 directly from the feds uh, and other funding sources but uh, we do know that there's a large push for for rural broadband infrastructure right now so uh, for this one I anticipate that we'll have some information back before the board you know shortly thank you and we also know that we do have the the lion's share of one of the projects committed, the funding for that committed, we're just waiting for confirmation on that, but it looks like that would free up some uh, significant funds if that were to, to happen. So, so as far as the RFI, will that, will that go come to us simultaneously as it's going out to the providers or do, will we just get notification and can we take a look at what that RFI looks like? Uh, would the board like to review it before we release it? No, I don't. I just wanted to be able to see it. So if you could CC us on it, I'd love to know when it goes out and what it entails. Will do. Thank you. I know Christian's probably working on that even as we speak. That's <laughs> multitasking. Thank you. Okay, Ken. All right. So um, this is the last slide. So I appreciate everyone. <laughs> 
their patients with this. Um, so again, you know, as far as the next steps, the first thing I'm going to do is um, compile all the notes and the um, the discussions that we had today. You know, as an example, I'll follow up with Abishaw about the one category. Um, and so we can start getting together what some of the various components and the and the number of proposals and RFIs and RFPs and grants. Um, and then I'll also based on today's discussions when I do a review of the notes and what we discussed, you know, we'll work on some timelines. So I'm hope I'm I'm hoping that the next step is is I'm going to come back and be able to report. Okay, this is what it's. Here's the various program elements. Here's what the timelines, what I'm recommending for a timeline. And here, here's how I'm going to staff or the resources or po possibly coming back with a request that I may need to add additional resources uh, to accomplish some of this. Um, I think uh, it was really helpful to kind of navigate and get into individual categories and get your feedback so um, I can make an informed recommendation on, on next steps. And uh, I just have it out there as questions about, you know, additional work sessions. I, I think it's going to be required um, for each of these elements, uh, especially once we have proposals ready to go. And, uh, you know, so maybe that'll be part of my next step when I come back with the timeline that then we can look at calendars and get set work sessions for each items. Um, because I also love deadlines um, to, to make sure that we're uh, making progress on all this. And the other, and I have a couple of questions out here, you know, that I also wanted to pose was, uh, are there specific categories that I just went over that you would really like to see first, that you really want us to concentrate an effort and get something on the calendar as quickly as possible and come back for further discussion? And then the other part is um, a discussion around whether or not you want to have community engagement or some type of how we're going to solicit input on uh, what we've prioritized in, 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 in this plan that we're, we're trying to progress and put together. Thank you, Ken. Commissioner's thoughts? Commissioner Kula. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think in terms of uh, prioritization, I would like to see child care, um, the child care portion of the economic impact um, be raised up simply because we are getting closer and closer to a new school year. Um, yeah. Which ideally will provide some of that, that child um, ending and nurturing component. Right. And we've got, and that under the category of economic impacts, that that encompasses so much. That's the lion's share of what we're doing here. So maybe we could tackle that one first. And then also, if if anybody has one that has, I know a couple of them have risen to the top in terms of immediacy. If there's some urgency to that, maybe we can address those if somebody has a real urgent need. And we keep using remnant initiatives as the example because they needed that short amount of, of gap funding from June, from July to January. So let's say, and it was a small ask, or let's say the mission needs, to, they have a small ask and they need to increased capacity over there, whether it's heat related or anything, they have a small ask. So if any of those come to, to mind, commissioners, if you would share those with Ken, maybe we can plug those in. And I think they probably, since because of the urgency, they might actually come under that category anyway. So that's all I would, I would add to that. Commissioner Bershauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't disagree with the childcare. I think that's probably the most pressing um, Sheridan School District did get an extension on their offer to October 15th, so that's fantastic news. Um, and they are coming up with that additional $50,000 on the uh, earnest money internally. Um, so that kind of takes that immediately off of our plate. But, um, you know, economic development, I, I guess, would be another one that I would prioritize. Um, I know initially we talked about setting up... Um, committees that were a little bit more specialized for some of these buckets, but I'm almost wondering if maybe that's a little bit too much work and too many cooks in the kitchen. I think um, where my mind is going is I don't know what McMinnville is planning or where, what the status is of what they're trying to do with their ARPA money um, or, or Newburgh or necessarily other cities. So 
Um, I would love for us to bring the mayors together and just get an update from them as to what their priorities are. I feel like that would help me better understand, um, you know, the impact that we're going to have in terms of spreading this money throughout our, our county. So I don't know if that's a, if that's a work session or if it, what it is. Um, but I know I personally would love to bring them together and say, Hey, you know, what's going on in your, in your city? What are you guys talking about in terms of priorities? Um, maybe that would give us a bit of a better framework rather than having to go in and set up individualized com uh, committees for each one of these buckets, which is kind of where we were talking initially. Um, you know, Commissioner Kula had the, the water infrastructure, um, meeting with everybody, which was really helpful, but there was so much information and so many different needs. And I feel like I kind of need to go back and revisit with their, the city leaders and say, okay, you know, what's come out of all these discussions for you guys. So that would be in terms of next steps, that would be beneficial for me at least. Um, and maybe uh, reduce the workload a bit in terms of setting up different um, committees. EDAC already exists, so I like the idea of having them come in on economic development. But in terms of some of these other things like childcare or, um, you know, even in the internal needs, um, you know, that's a lot of work. So I, I guess I would, that would be my request of uh, one of the steps going forward. Thank you, because I know early on I had reached out and said to the cities, hey, what does it look like? What are you going to be focusing on? And they said, well, they're still working on that. And we were working on ours, so we never did hear back. That's a good idea. We should probably find out where they went, but a lot of them are waiting for us. <laughs> Ken? Well, the one thing that uh, comes to mind, um, and I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. All right. Um, the one thought that, that comes to mind about getting together, the one thing that we haven't done in quite some time, because it kind of went away when the pandemic is, we used to have the local government dinners at one point. And I almost wonder if, uh, you know, I can have a conversation with the city managers and maybe this is something that we could even bring in COG to kind of facilitate maybe a combined work session that in place of a, because COG was the one that used to put together the local government dinners where we would all get together with their city councils. And, um, and, and we haven't had one of those in quite some time that maybe uh, put together some type of a combined work session. And, and I can reach out and see what kind of capacity COG has um, to kind of organize that. It kind of takes the burden off uh, my staff but, and also off the, the cities in, in making that happen. Yeah, because remember when we would meet with the tribe, that was a really good one on one. We got a real good feel for what they were working on and we got a, you know, vice versa. And we were able to actually get something done because it was more of an intimate um, gathering. So maybe if we did something like that, had COG do it, they got off the hook because they didn't have to plan any of these dinners and things. So we could maybe get a, a lunch or a, or a work session together. That would be great. Okay, I, I will reach out to Cog and and I just emphasize because I can hear I can hear Carrie Hinton rolling her eyes at me right now because I know she does a lot of work in organizing. You know, um, Cog helps facilitate, but we do have staff that are, are really busy with that. So I do want to recognize Carrie. I I know you do a lot of work when those local government dinners were being held. So, but I can reach out to Cog and we can see if we can facilitate something and, and get something put together. So we can hear some updates on, on what the other jurisdictions have planned as well. Good deal. And thank you for all the work that you did on this, Ken. I know that was, um, that was a lot of work. So I'm going to recommend that we take a five minute break and then come back at the point of consent agenda item G, and then we'll go from there. If that's okay. Thank you. Sounds great, Chair, and thank you, Ken.
It looks like Commissioner Bershauer is in the the audience. So let's let's wait for her if we can. Oh, technology. Okay, we are back. We're continuing the Yamhill County Board of Commissioners formal informal session for what is today, August 5th, 2021. And we are rejoining the meeting at the point of item G, which is the consent agenda because we have no department updates. So do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we present, uh, we approve the consent agenda as presented, Chair. Mo motion motion uh, made. Do we have a uh, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. On to old business, we have none. Uh, other business, we have item I-1, which is consideration for approve of approval for Public Works to pub purchase a 2022 Freightliner M22 chipper bucket truck from Custom Truck One Source in the amount of $146,912. Do we have a motion to approve? Chair, I move to approve. Oh, I won. <laughs> Uh, we have a motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. On to item two, which is uh, consideration of the appointments of the to the local public safety coordinating council Lipsic, each to three year terms to expire July 2024. A is Lieutenant Jose Jesse Orozco with the state police, the designee to replace Sergeant Brad Hessel. Do we have a motion to approve? I, I move that we approve. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I move that we approve. We have a motion to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. On to item 2B, Anna Fela, the lay citizen member to replace the position vacated by Jeff Mecklers. Do we have a motion to approve? I move that we approve, Chair. We have a motion to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion passes two to one. On to item I-3, the discussion of a letter to Governor Brown in support of continuing local control regarding COVID-19 protocols and opposing the mask, man mask mandates for children K through 12. We've been seeing an awful lot of county commissions, a lot of boards that have been writing le similar letters to the governor and they've been approached by their superintendents and by a lot of parents in their school districts asking for, for some help in that regard. I have a letter, but I do want to point out that the, that the letter that you have in front of you and the letter that's in the packet contains some information that was supposed to be CC'd to the superintendents and not listing them as those who have asked for continuation of the local decision making. So we're going to make that correction. But the uh, this will be CC to all of the Yamhill County superintendents. We have a number of county uh, of superintendents who have reached out to us and approved of this letter, and they include the Sheridan superintendent Doris Vickery. Dory Vickery. We have Willamina superintendent Carrie 
Zimbrick, and we have the Amity Superintendent, Jeff Clark, who joins us today and would like to share some of his thoughts. But we have, have heard from a number of parents who are concerned about and, and are just unequivocally saying they won't send their children back masked for the school year. And so uh, this letter basically is, is what it's saying is that the board supports our county school district, superintendents, parents, and teachers in advocating for local decision-making regarding COVID-19 mitigation me measures, whether to require children attending K through 12 in-person classes to wear masks during the school day. I went on to write, Governor, we appreciate your decision in June to shift from a state-centric model and acknowledge that e each local school district is guided by a superintendent, a school board, parents, and advocates who understand and can address the unique circumstances in their communities and are uniquely positioned to address the health and well-being of their students. Superintendents have asked for a continuation of this community-focused approach, and the Yamhill County Board of Commissioners has confidence in their ability to make those reasoned and informed decisions regarding, among other considerations, the masking of children during school hours. So Jeff Clark is the superintendent in Amity. If we could have him, uh, he has, if we could just, Carrie, can you promote Superintendent Clark so that he can join us? Here we go. Superintendent, thank you for joining us. We see you. We don't, we don't see you. There we go. Yeah. Superintendent Clark, thank you for joining us and thank you for reaching out and for your advocacy. Uh, please just sort of give us an, an idea of the meetings that you've had with ODE and with the uh, with CASA. Well, it's COSA, COSA. Um, <clears throat> it's CASA's, I think, the uh, board the, appointed the special advocate. Right? Yeah. <laughs> There's too many acronyms in our life, way too many. Uh, thank you for having me today. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share a little bit of perspective from a small school district. Uh, most of you know uh, Amity fairly well, and uh, we are uh, proud of our, our rural status as a school district. Uh, we are one of many rural school districts, obviously, across Oregon, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I have been in contact with several dozen of those superintendents across the state, uh, and it has been uh, with unanimity that they have responded uh, likewise, that they would like to see that maintained local control of this type of decision making. Uh, we were very excited when uh, Governor Brown uh, relinquished that uh, and gave it back to the school districts to make those decisions. Uh, we would like to see that continue. Uh, as a school district, we know that um, there's, there's mixed uh, messages out there on masking. Uh, but there's a lot of information and much of it would indicate that masking is <clears throat> not a significant uh, way of preventing viral transmission, whereas uh, hand washing and other types of hygiene practices are significant uh, inhibitors of viral transmission. And we do those things very well within our school districts, a very controlled environment. In fact, it's the most controlled environment that most kids are in during their day. And the interesting thing about this new mandate from the governor is that it only applies in classrooms during the school day uh, or in the school building during the school day. It does not apply to activities or clubs or sports, even if those activities and clubs happen in the exact same classroom that the kids just left a few minutes earlier uh, as a student. So there's not really a logical connection between what's being asked and what's uh, and what the result might be of that. Uh, during a regular classroom, obviously teachers have much more control. It's a much more structured environment than a club or an activity would be. Uh, and yet the concern seems to be um, uh, only with the classroom time. So that's it's interesting uh, that that would be the decision. Not that I'm trying to encourage the governor to extend that to other things, but uh, there just seems to be a gap in the logic here. If uh, that's really the concern. <clears throat> As a school district, uh, uh, during this past school year, we had kids back as soon as anybody in Yamhill County and uh, most of the west side of the state uh, and experienced absolutely zero transmission at school. Uh, we had some COVID cases where we could trace it back to kids' contact over the weekends with peers or with family members, 
Uh, some parents brought it from work home, uh, but we didn't see any transmission at school. We didn't have a single staff member uh, become affected. And that includes uh, those who were working with kids in small group instruction prior to coming back in a hybrid model in February. Uh, what else can I answer for you? Uh, uh, we as a school district, uh, and, I, and I know at least the other four small school districts in Yamhill County, uh, superintendents are like-minded in this. Some of them have not had a chance to meet with their boards yet, and so they uh, don't have the official district um, position. Uh, that'll be coming in the next week or two from those districts. Uh, Amity's in a little bit different situation between my relationship and my school board here. Thank you, Superintendent. Commissioners, thoughts, questions for <clears throat> Superintendent Clark. Commissioner Kula. Yes, um, Chair, thank you. Um, and um, Superintendent Clark, I, um, I happened to receive your, uh, your letter that you sent out to community members. Um, and so I've, I had a heads up and I was able to follow through on the sources that were cited um, in, your, uh, in your letter. Um, and so I guess the, um, the question is, is the, the first question, but I have a series of them, um, so don't, don't go too far. The first question would be, is there any reason why you chose to cite an article about mask effectiveness from 2016 rather than the ones that are available from 2021? Um, the reason I was cited is because it was pretty extensive as far as I could tell uh, in terms of their survey of the research that had been done on viral transmission. Um, you know, viruses, I do have a background in biology. I was a lab technician both at OHSU uh, in a research lab there and at uh, Oregon State in a genetics research lab uh, back in my uh, post-college days. And uh, so I do have some background in that. And, you know, and viral transmission is, is of respiratory diseases is pretty standard. It doesn't really matter, um, you know, whether you're talking about um, 2021 or 2016 or 1986, the transmission is going to be done, accomplished exactly the same way. And, and the bottom line is most of the mask people are wearing don't really do anything anyway, because they're just a cloth apparatus that that doesn't stop airflow of any significant uh, proportion. So unless somebody is, is effectively being kind of spit on by somebody else talking right in their face, uh, the mask really isn't gonna do anything in terms okay, of Okay, so transition. as a follow up then, uh, Chair, if I may. Um, so you chose to cite a 2016 article rather than the 2021, which cited the 2016. I just find that really interesting if you are in fact understanding the world to be a, a progression of knowledge. So um, I'm not intimately familiar with the 2021 one. You're welcome to forward it to me if you'd like and take a look at it. Okay, so thanks. Um, so my second question would be, um, uh, when you had zero transmission um, uh, of COVID in your, in your school um, last uh, school season, school year, um, were students and uh, teachers wearing masks? For the most part, they were supposed to be. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know what the fidelity of that is. There's obviously a lot of people touching their masks, moving them around, taking mask breaks, doing other things. Um, but, um, yeah, but we also had a lot of kids hanging out. Uh, I mean, we have an open campus at the high school. Kids come and go at lunchtime. They don't wear a mask when they're at lunch together. Um, uh, they, they did lots of activities together outside of school, and we saw almost, almost zero transmission outside of school as well. Now, if you want to go back and actually look at what happened at Amity in January of 2020 and uh, February 2020, there was quite a few people that got sick, but there were no precautions being taken back then. I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, can I, as a follow-up, what, what exactly do you mean by that then? Um, just well, I think, I, think a lot of, I think there was a lot of COVID transmission across the country back in January and February of 2020. Um, you know, kids were sent home. If they went and saw the doctor, they were told they didn't have the flu and they were told to go home and take Tylenol and rest until they got over it, which they all did, so. Okay, so are, you're, you're suggesting, I'm guessing that protective measures were helpful at reducing the transmission. I think that uh, sanitizing, encouraging kids to keep some distance between each other, not share water bottles, um, you know, uh, those things that kids tend to do um, are the most effective means, hand hygiene, uh, those are the most effective means of stopping transmission of viruses. Okay, so then a follow-up question, if I may, Chair. Yeah, um, okay. so if, Commissioner, go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Superintendent Clark, um, since it sounds like uh, you, you had pretty successful um, reduction of transmission um, and associated with masking, um, with local control, are you planning to require masks? 
That would be a decision. That would be a decision the board and, and I would make together along with the administration and the schools. We would just like to have that flexibility to be able to make that based on our demographics and what's happening within our community. So before the um, when it was under local control, but before um, the governor's most recent question or most recent um, statement, uh, executive order, um, what was the position of the school district and the superintendent? We have not required masks on our campus all summer. Okay. Okay, so do you anticipate- but That's only been, I mean, that's only, that only goes back to the, basically the last week of June through July, right? So it's not like we've had a lot of people on campus anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I wanna point out that I had contacted Dr. Dean Seidlinger uh, with the state and asked him if there were any randomized control studies showing the efficacy of masks within a healthy population. And he uh, admitted that there were not, and then pointed me to the CDC website, which had studies on masks, but no controlled randomized studies, which I think is, is instructive. Commissioner Bershauer, did you have any comments? And Superintendent Clark, I just want to um, clarify. So the mask mandate is where students in a classroom have to wear masks, but if they're in the lunchroom together in, in an enclosed indoor room eating lunch together, they do not. Correct. Nor, nor do they have to wear masks if they are participating in after school activities or sports that happen to be inside of a building. Correct. Um, the And also during the school day, if they're doing an activity where uh, wearing a mask might endanger their safety, they don't have to wear one. Um, yeah, it makes about as much sense as these school board members coming into a meeting inside of a building into a room, um, deciding that they're going to mask children while they're not wearing masks themselves during the meeting. Um, I don't envy your position. I think it, this is going to be a pretty significant fight going forward. I just read yesterday that um, Orange County School Board uh, and Superintendent are actually planning to sue Governor Newsom over this over this new rule in California. So. Um, I anticipate this debate um, is going to get more heated as we go forward here. Um, I think you're correct. If there's anything that we can do, I'm a mother of, of three teenagers now that are going to be subject to this. And so if there's anything we can do to support you uh, in this effort to maintain local control, I will be, I will be doing that. Thank so you. Thank appreciate you. that. Commissioner, uh, uh, Superintendent Clark, can you give us an idea of the uh, the sentiments of the other superintendents in Yamhill County. I know you've reached out to all of them. We've heard back from Superintendent Vickery and Superintendent Simbrick and Superintendent of Dayton School. Superintendent Sugg has let us know that he is approving of this. However, he needs to check with the school board. But what's the feeling that you're getting in terms of, I guess the issue here is, is while it's masking, it really comes down to local control, local decision-making. Uh, based on the community's needs and specifics. Exactly. And, uh, and the other two superintendents that, or the three superintendents you didn't mention, Clint Reaver is uh, superintendent at YC now. Uh, he and I have emailed back and forth and he's of like mind, but has not had a board meeting yet to be able to confirm uh, the district's official position on this. Uh, I'm uh, be on the phone with Joe Morlock from Newburgh this afternoon, and I'm meeting with um, uh, Debbie Brockett tomorrow um, Gonna have a cup of coffee and get to know each other a little bit, and I'll. Uh, she's in a difficult position coming in as a new uh, first year superintendent in Am or in uh, McMinnville there, and uh, and I don't know where the McMinnville or the Newburgh boards are. Uh, I don't know those communities real well. I don't interact with them a lot. Um, the other four um, smaller school districts, uh, I'm much more uh, kind of intimate with their philosophies and their strategies on on different um, educational things. Um, so I know that the, the five small school superintendents are very like-minded in this. Um, it doesn't mean that we would all do the same thing, by the way, within our districts. Uh, what it means is that we would like to have the option to make that decision based on our community, our situation. Uh, and we feel this way about a lot of things, by the way, not just this. Uh, it's just that, that uh, the masking mandate has become, um, you know, kind of the, the touch point if you will, for this whole discussion about what should be um, under the control of the state and what should be under control of local communities and districts. And I know you guys as county commissioners like to have control over your own county. Uh, you, you know what's good for your county and you don't want the state coming in and, and making mandates that maybe don't fit with what you believe you should be doing at that time. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things that we experienced 
the superintendent meeting on Monday, statewide superintendent meeting with Colt Gill uh, and OHA uh, was present there as well, uh, as well as OSBA and, and COSA, um, was that effectively we were told as superintendents um, um, that we may experience professional discipline up to and including a loss of our license, uh, that we might experience fines of up to $500 a day per occurrence, though they don't know what per occurrence means in this case, uh, and uh, that we may face civil and criminal litigation uh, for endangering the welfare of children, which is very interesting. I've been in education a long time. I've been a superintendent uh, in the state of Oregon for 19 years now, and uh, I don't think that I have ever been accused of putting children in danger, um, and in fact, have uh, taken a lot of pride in protecting our kids. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a risk reward with everything we do in life, and um, Personally, I'm a conservative libertarian. Um, I, I really don't like to tell other people how to run their lives. Um, as a school district superintendent, I have to make decisions for our district, uh, but I don't tell other districts what I think they should do in a particular situation because their, their situation may have some different variables than mine does. Uh, and so that's all we're really asking. And I think that um, outside of some large school districts, there's, there's pretty much a unanimous front on this philosophy across the state. The larger districts don't want to make these decisions generally uh, because they don't want to um, deal with the political fallout of having picked a side on an issue. They'd rather be able to say the state mandates this. We don't have any choice. Um, and, and again, that's their issue. I, I don't know what it's like to be a Salem-Kaiser superintendent or a Beaverton superintendent or whatever. Um, but I know in a small town, um, we interact with our public a lot. And we have a pretty good feel for um, for, for what they want as parents. And, and we feel very strongly about um, trying to support parents in their rights um, to have the type of educational environment they want for their children. And that's not just, again, a masking issue. That's a lot of different issues that come under this umbrella of local control. This is just one of them. Thank you, Superintendent. Are you hearing from parents who are saying that they will take their children out of the public schools if this mass mandate continues? Yes. Yeah, I don't have an exact number, but there are definitely quite a few parents who feel that way. Uh, and, and that's frustrating for me uh, as a superintendent. Obviously, um, there's the number of students you have in your school directly affects your finances, which directly affects your employment levels and what programs you can offer and things like that. And it's, and it's hard to recover from, def, from, uh, from cuts that you might have to make to your budget. Um, and, you know, we're not in a position to run at a deficit for very long. So a uh, very small one, maybe, but not a very big one. And, and if we were to lose, I mean, we lost last year uh, roughly about uh, 12 to 13 percent of our student enrollment um, just over uh, the combination of, of distance learning and then hybrid and masking and all those things together. I don't want to point at one particular issue, uh, but really what it came down to was parents just not having their kids in the type of educational environment they wanted. And so um, and, and I think there's more that we will lose and, and uh, ones that would come back that won't come back if we're still faced with that. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Kula, and then we're oh, going to actually vote on this letter. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I was going to address that. I don't have any further questions for Superintendent Clark. Okay. I appreciate, I do appreciate the time that you guys have given me. Um, I don't speak officially on behalf of the other superintendents in Yamhill County, but I do know how the other small school superintendents feel about this. We actually meet monthly uh, and have lunch and, and talk about small school issues in Yamhill County. Um, our, uh, our ESD stopped having face-to-face -face meetings uh, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, we decided last August uh, that we were gonna continue to have our own because it was important for, for us to be on the same page uh, within our county. And uh, we've actually invited Dan Dugan in from Perrydale to join into that as well. And so um, that is, uh, if you ever have it, something where you want some feedback from the small schools, uh, across Yamhill County, we'd be more than happy to bring that up in one of our meetings and, and discuss whatever topics you'd like us to. We do appreciate the work you guys do, and we love living in Yamhill County. Thank you, Superintendent. So at this point, I'm well, going to ask. Sorry, Chair. Yes, I, I go actually ahead, was, wanted to make a comment, but I think I believe that Superintendent joined. Um, so, Superintendent, thank you for joining us. I will be sure to extend an invitation to the round, the leadership roundtable, which happens on Tuesday afternoons. And um, Superintendent Sig um, regularly joins us. So it'd be good to hear from you as well. I didn't hear, when did you say those happen? It's Sorry. on Tuesday afternoons. Okay, thank you. But I'll, um, I'll pull up your uh, email address and get you on the list. Thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, thank you.
Um, I did want to note that um, uh, for Chair Starrett that I think it's um, urgently, vitally important that we make sure that um, students are in school full time this year. Um, that to me is kind of our baseline. We need to make sure this happens. In my view, um, so I'm I disagree with Superintendent Clark and with um, it sounds like Chair Starrett that um, the the information out there shows that masks are effective in various ways and in different with different materials. And so I think we do a disservice to the public to give them old data about a different disease and a different virus. Um, but with that, I would like to see um, that whatever we need to do in order to make sure that schools stay open for as many people full time as possible is what I support. Um, but I, I, I wanna say thank you for joining us, Superintendent Clark, and thank you for attempting to answer the question about a 2016 versus a 2021 study. I thank appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I want to point out that there have been subsequent studies that show, if you want to look at the Danish study, that was fairly recent, Commissioner Kula, and that shows the inefficacy of the masks, the typically the masks that people wear out in the community. And I want to point out how important it is, and this is not an issue that people are taking lightly, that the psychological, the physical, the ramifications of masking children as young as five years old, we've got something called the uh, day of action, where people are being, it's suggested that people are unenrolling their children over this issue. This is something that is significant enough for people to say, I will not send my student to school um, masked up for the remainder of, of, the, uh, of the school year. So with that, uh, I wanna say, we're talking about the issue of local control. We're talking about the issue of overreach and the state-centric approach, one size fits all. And this is gonna be an issue that people are gonna throw down on. And this is where we, we basically say, at what point do we say, when does this end? So I'm gonna ask the board to sign on for this letter to support local control in our, in our uh, school districts. All those in favor signify oh, by saying aye. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Kula, did you want to talk again? Commissioner Pichero wanted to say something. Who? Sorry, Chair, I thought you were going to call. That's okay. Okay. Go I just ahead. wanted. To, I just wanted to say that it, what's alarming to me is that the threat of not complying is to threaten superintendents with their licenses or teachers. It's also to remove the power of the school board completely and place it into the state essentially, which is just unprecedented. So that bothers me. That is a total overreach of government. Um, and at the very least, I support local control and um, I am totally 100% on board with this letter. So thank you for bringing it forward. Okay, so I have- Do you have a motion? I made a motion. Okay. So the motion is to approve the letter to Kate Brown, Governor Kate Brown, and copy it to the Department of Education, Director Cole Gill, to our senators, representatives, to Yamhill County superintendents. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Aye. Let the record show Commissioners Bershauer and Sterrett voted in favor of the letter to the governor regarding masking and Commissioner Kula voted against. Thank you so much. And thank you, Superintendent Clark, for joining us. We do appreciate that. We are now at the point of item. Well, that's it. So we have no public hearings. Do we have announcements? We've got Ken Huffer making an announcement or trying to. <laughs> or I'm not uh, making an announcement. Uh, I just wanted, uh, Commissioner Kula, you had some items that you were wanting to bring forward uh, for discussion. Yes, and um, the, um, I was gonna do that during announcements, at least a couple of them to, to tee them up for future conversations. One of them wasn't ready since uh, Director Friday wasn't around. Um, but so a couple of them, uh, Chair Starrett, I just wanted to bring up that I hope we can have further conversations about is um, the Yamhill County Public Works has a, a new quote unquote new building. And um, one of our um, longtime public works liaisons, um, which is um, uh, as a commissioner was Ted Lopazinski. And um, I wanted to float to you the proposal. It was as I was waking up the other day, I was like, gosh, it would be really nice to honor um, Commissioner Lapazinski by at least th considering naming it or naming part of it after him. Um, and I, I just feel like it would be a good way of recognizing he put so much effort um, in the past into making sure we had a good public works infrastructure. 
Thank you. I think it's great that we we start to continue, and I appreciate the work of of the of the commissioner, um, Lapazinski, and he would come up until not that long ago and visit and give us his input and that that institutional knowledge is is worth everything so i appreciate that i think in the in terms of process and in, in terms of getting the community involved i would love to have people weigh in on who they would like to have perhaps uh, that building named after I so yes a, thank you for that suggestion there. and and yes ken well and i would just uh with the discussion and it's been a while but it it rings familiar, but I believe we have an ordinance that I'd need to take a look at as well um, that that talks about um, rules around, you know, the ordinance is specific around process uh, related to something like this. So um, I'm not prepared to, obviously, because I am not able to go right to the ordinance, but I remember that we had a previous discussion before and I can be prepared if there's going to be further discussion. Right. I think, yeah, I think we should do some due diligence and then and then uh, proceed according to, as Commissioner Olson would say, people process the product. <laughs> I think it's people process policy, right? Policy? I think it's policy. It's, 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 the, three P's. I know it's that. the three P's. I know that. OK. Uh, so the other the only other uh, thing is that um, I was um, I was hoping to have um, your permission or at least um, your interest, and it doesn't need to be in this meeting, um, but to get more information on um, what's coming up, which is the accessory dwelling unit um, statute that's allowed uh, for accessory dwelling units on um, rural residential land. And I know that the planning department is working on that, has done the first step of taking action to implement it. And I just wanted, to, I wasn't sure, it's, it's going to be a big deal for families in rural areas. Um, I hear from people fairly regularly, a steady stream who are interested in making use of this. So I, I wasn't sure if you'd want to hear from him in person or whether you'd want to see a document from him, but I wanted to flag it for you because I think it's a big deal. Yes, it is. I think when when D Director Friday has some more for us, I'd love to do a, a presentation where he can bring us up to speed on, on, on what the options are for the county. But at, that, at some point in the future, we should plan a work session. But thank you for that. Anything else? Okay, Commissioner Bershauer, announcements. Thank you, Chair. I had uh, the fair, which we kind of already talked on. They had the huge opening day, which is awesome. Uh, Sheridan School District extension on their offer. Uh, we went over that, so that's good. Um, and the only other thing is that um, on Monday night, the city of Newburgh um, voted, the city councilors voted unanimously to uh, send the urban renewal proposal to the, the city voters. So uh, in response to our decision, uh, they did vote unanimously to do that. So that's all of my announcements for today. Thank you. Thank you for that. And also, I just wanted to reiterate that the CCO is going to finalize. It's been through finance and executive committees to finance funding for, this, for uh, the 200 unit affordable housing stratus project, the 72 units in Sheridan that the county is working on, and Project Turnkey, the 55 units that YCAP is working on. So we're, we're going to get significant amounts of money dedicated to each one of those. And I'll have continued discussions with uh, the Housing Authority this week because other counties are involved in, are interested in the model that we've been using, which is to use foreclosed properties for public benefit. So uh, great success there. So that's all I have. If there's anything else, Commissioner Kula, yes, is there something I else? To clarify in question, um, do you, um, as we saw the federal eviction moratorium um, end, um, but the emergency rental assistance um, still ongoing, do you know how our local partners are doing in getting that money out to, uh, to landlords and renters who need it? Well, we know that there was the, uh, the landlord funding came through, uh, we, had, we had sort of bookends. We had YCAP with one bucket of funding for, for the renter's assistance. And, um, and then you had the landlord assistance. So you had, you had those two concerns that were funding each one of those. So, okay. Anything else for the good of the order? If there's nothing else, thank you all very much. And I want to thank Carrie Hinton and Carolina Rook and also County Council and our administrator for all the work that goes into these sessions. Thank you all very much.